morning and thank you for having me here. Um, mm. As Denise said, I mean, it was definitely a week ago I didn't know I was doing this because this, case, this particular slot was going to be filled by Brian, by Brian from the Absa Bank in South Africa, which is Barclays in South Africa. Um, but when Don phoned me and said that Brian couldn't come, would what I have got and, and up my sleeve meet the brief that you have had and have come to this session to, to hear? Actually, interestingly, it would. And that's actually very interesting for me because South Africa as a country is one which is way behind the game in many ways. But some people now are beginning to move together in, diff in their different slots to, to do things. So, what this is, and hold your hats because this is a roller coaster for 20 minutes, we're going to go through a story which is effectively about four or five years old um, in its origins, but is now moving at a tremendous speed. It's a story of failures and successes in that order, it's a story of all sorts of exciting things. And I have one of the most exciting jobs in the world. This is Africa in the dawn and the, in the bush. I have to show that because I used to live there. And it's a story about if at first you don't succeed, swallow all the evidence that you've tried uh, somewhere along the line, uh, because it really is. So it, it's a journey about a company called Escom. It's the world's fifth largest electricity generating utility. It's state owned, so it has a political agenda that it has to service. And of course, as an electricity utility, it's critical to the, to the national strategy of growth and reconciliation and the, the development of the emerging company economy. So it's a very, very interesting company to work with. It has huge challenges facing it right at the moment. And I have had the luck, I've got the lovely, loveliest job in the world. I lived in South Africa until the end of 2009, and then had to come home for domestic reasons. And I thought I was getting out of what was happening to me. And my clients in South Africa said to me, ah, 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 ah. what you can do now you can go back to England and you can research a global best practice for us and bring it to us in a new form. So this is an attempt to show some agility and to do some other things. So I now have the license to travel the world and assemble a team to do what's going on. It's a fabulous job. And I'll be going back to South Africa in a couple of weeks to tell them the latest story around it. But what we're faced with is an archaic training function, 99% face to face. Um, L&D, not listening to the business, all sorts of things. An aging workforce is typical of the utility industry globally. People are moving out of it. Skills base is going to experience skills base is going to diminish by about 65, 70% in the next 10 years globally. But coming into this particular company, 5,000 new engineers. And very helpfully, the CEO promised the state president that for every one he trained for himself, he'd train another one for the country. So the issue is now how do you train 10,000 engineers in the ancillary stuff? For any organization, that would be an incredible challenge. Put it into a third world environment and you've got Mission Impossible, or have we? You have to see. They're young, they're energetic, but they have no experience. And they've been pulled through the system because the organization is expanding at an incredible rate. It's going to double in size over the next 10 years as new power plants are built. And then you have the geographical challenges which result from the fact that South Africa is the size of Western Europe and the power plants are spread over that kind of thing. So imagine a power plant in Rome, one in, one in Budapest, one in Paris, one in, in London. You know, the power plants are very widely spread. So there's some huge challenges in trying to do work there. So that's where we started, and that's where, what happened. So what were the threats? And this is where the business advantage starts to come in, because if you're looking to train 10,000 engineers in a country which does not have a good education system, does not have a very good university system, you have to pull very hard on the, on the skill pool. So what are you going to do to attract them into, into that business? Right? Because there's a threat to the national development growth program if there's no power. And right now, South Africa is experiencing growing blackouts. There is not enough power. They have to get new stuff on the street very quickly. There's the risk of inability, inability to commission new plants. No engineers, no, 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 no production. And then, worst of all, there's a risk of an inability to recruit. If the company is not in line, with what young people want, it ain't going anywhere. So this is where we started, right? And then the impossibility of that tradition of those traditional methodologies being there. That's one of the new plants being built. This is a mothball plant which has been brought back into service. And these are some of the young people, um, or maybe some, looking like some of the young people who are there. So what was the change? Well, the change was the appointment of a senior line manager, a production manager, probably one of the most successful power station managers that there has ever been globally pulled out of his line job and said, please help fix this problem. He has a couple of henchmen, Robert, um, Esme, and Leverhan. Leverhan and Esme were faced with the wonderful job of tidying up an LMS which didn't work and getting some decent records right for these 5,000 students. We didn't even know which universities they were at. 
the, the, the record systems were so bad that we didn't even know where it was all at. So that's where we started with this whole thing. We had to do a lot of research. And part of what we did was to use Laura's organisation to do an informal benchmark from where we were. I've been kind to the organisation here. We were actually in the lowest B side, <coughs> not the lowest quarter, of what was going on. But never mind. Um, we've been busy with best practice research and, and, and so on. So, what did we do to define the need? Well, there's a huge skills gap. And I've tried to portray that by two people sitting on opposite sides looking in different directions about what was going on. Lots of dissonances happening. We used, some of you who are familiar with um, Jane Hart's work, we used to five stages of learning, and that little model there to, to help with that. If you, if you don't know about it, talk to me afterwards. We tried to highlight the impossibility because we found things like this. That's a model that I think up the net is not quite as bad as, as that in SDOM, but that's how an online course could be designed. Every little block beyond there, which you can't read, every little block beyond there is another step that was in it. It was over complex, people didn't want to know, they couldn't take any, any account of it. We did a lot of research, we started to engage, and we started to erase the awareness of the, of, of the risk. Our line manager started to say to his colleagues, who were sort of saying, well, Terry, why have you actually moved out of line to do this job? You're a successful line manager. Said, because our organization is going down the tubes. And we're not going to be able to pull it round unless we do something radically different in here. And then one of the things that we had to do was to locate and take a new champion, and I'll come on to that in a minute. But we also had to present a new vision, and you'll see that slide, that, that particular picture reoccur in, in just a few moments. We had to try and do something different. So the next we had to initiate the change. ESCOM has a partnership with EDF um, in this country. So I got in touch with EDF and said, what are you doing? And EDF had done some very exciting things here in France and all the rest of it. It has a twinning arrangement, and EDF are now doing some work in this whole learning environment with us. Also talk to the Internet Time Alliance. People far out on the fringe. Right? What are you doing? What's different? And I actually took Jane Hart out to South Africa just exactly 12 months ago now, just to open people's eyes and minds and get, get her to talk to people about a potentially different way of doing things. But what we had was an incredibly bad experience of trying to introduce social media. The attempts that were put in by people in the organisation with the very best intentions failed. And they failed because they were not well structured, they were not well communicated, they were not well organized, and they were also subverted by the IT department. Um, is that a familiar story anyone? Um, somewhere along the line. So strong resistance, and we had to look for ways around the system. Robert was, was um, who you saw in the previous picture, very, very active in trying to find ways around the system. We had hours and days with me on the internet as well, trying to work out how we could we get round the IT system to make something happen in the organization. So that was the initiation of the change. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, it's quite possible you haven't understood the situation. And that's exactly where we were at, at that particular point. We knew something had to happen. We were trying to make it happen. We got blocked at every turn. And every time we walked, looked around the corner, there were three more things that rose up in front of us. Um, so we had a huge problem on our hands. But then suddenly, about six, Nine months ago, ten months ago, just after I took Jane out to South Africa, um, a few things started to happen, which which changed, which began to change the whole thing. Somebody in the organisation created a Yammer community outside the firewall, and if you know Yammer, Yammer is a, when you have a domain, anybody with that domain can join it. it cannot be stopped. So all of a sudden, within six weeks, of the about twenty-five thousand skilled workers in the company. 5,000 of them had joined the Yammer community, which was illegitimate. Oh, the IT hub department were not a happy boys at all. What can we do to stop it? And I can give you a litany of this long of things they've done to try and stop it because it wasn't legitimate. However, 5,000 moved to 10,000. And now they're faced with a real dilemma. The whole company wants to talk to itself. So all sorts of things then started to, to open up. At the same time, there was an upgrade of, the, of, of SAP going into the organization. And the LMS was designed, was, was intended to provide the basic training for the new SAP system. It fell over. It could not cope with what was going on. I won't tell you which LMS it was. Um, but what actually happened at the end of the day was the engineering director, Machado Coco, understood that there might be a different way forward. We went back to him with what, what we'd heard when, when, when I was out there a year ago um, and said, we think we found a different way of doing things. 
And he said, hmm, good idea. Why don't you actually go and explore it and come back and give me an idea? So we have a huge amount of work going on. We engage an organization called OER Africa to look at you know, the edu open educational resources that are available globally. And I took him, took him back in October, 79 spreadsheets, 79 sheets of a spreadsheet of what the material relevant to the business problems he has. He said, that material is available. Look at what you've got, which is archaic, being taught face to face. This is open access. Why not? And what else can we do? Because what you're doing is you're assessing people's competence in the wrong way. You're actually not giving them confidence that they can perform in the workplace. What you're doing is asking them to pass interviews. What they need to do is to get into something which will actually allow them to develop their skills to a point where they can hold their hand up and say, I think I'm ready. Please test it. So we started to look at things of that kind. And what happened was that Cello actually understood this. And I was commissioned to carry on and find some of the best research, do some more of the benchmarking. We were still in the bottom piece, by the way, last year, so don't worry about it too much yet. <coughs> All right? And to find the areas of attention, find, find a way forward, and assemble something to do with it. But we had more obstacles. The moment, the moment he said, we're going to do this, I actually found something else to block us from. One, one way or another. But also what we were finding at that stage, and this goes back to what Laura was saying, the agility of the L&D department wasn't there. They were held down in traditional things. They could not get their heads up. They could not listen in a different way to what was going on, and they did not support the whole thing. So now we've got the HR-led L&D function. We've got the line management change function, intent on driving change from a business perspective. So what do we do? Well, the change team got a bit fed up because they kept getting blocked. Um, and then the healing delivery, as I told you, associated with that inter enterprise problem, fell over. Right? Why? Because it was externally designed, and it was top-down imposed, and people wouldn't accept it. They didn't want to engage with it. They couldn't see a purpose in doing it. It was interfering with what they knew they had to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Badly communicated, not aligning them to smart working. So, where are we now? Princess, having had sufficient experience with princes, seeks from them. Right. What do we do? Well, line suddenly became a very supportive stakeholder. Marcello suddenly said, okay, I believe in what you're doing here. Right. I will help you get through these problems. And he helped drive Yama through, despite the IT blockages. He actually wanted it created as a, as a research project to actually assess how well social media would actually help with learning and the transmission of knowledge through the organization. So, we had to go out to social media policy, they hadn't got one. My research took some stuff back to say to, to say to people, all right, here are some good examples, let's put a policy together. And what then happened was open, the social media got opened up to staff on a limited basis. Excuse me folks, they're allowed to look at it between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon and after 5 o'clock. What does that tell you about the attitude to social media? That it's rubbish. However, it started to open the door, and people started to use it very sensibly. So what happened then? We went back to Machella in the beginning of uh, November, and we said to him, we've got an idea. Um, and he listened, and see what he looks like. He's head down, and see what he was thinking. He listened to us for a quarter of an hour, and we put this plan in front of him. He said, I want to do it. Go away and make it happen. Now that's quite stunning from the number two of the organization. Listen for a quarter of an hour, Please make it happen. And what's more, I want you to move out of the L&D function, out of, that, out of that learning environment, into the line environment as a research project which will be driven to conclusion to find out what we can do. So this is the agility that's coming in this man's thinking to say we will try and make something very different happen. And I just want to spend a few minutes telling you what that's about. So where are we going from here? Terry's still there, but what there is now, uh, this isn't it include, totally inclusive? There's a, a large team of people that I've sourced from around the world, and it literally is a global community of thought leaders to help design and to advise on the implementation of what is going to happen with this whole thing. So, formal established, project established, which is reporting to the board and with business related outcomes. So, it's now shifted from we are doing learning into we are improving the business, we're ensuring that the business will succeed. And our, heads are on the block from exactly that perspective. The very subtle leadership of the Yellow Network 
And what's happened with that Yammer network is now something over 100 groups have spoken and out spontaneously within the organization. They're nascent communities of practice. they people beginning to come together to talk to one another about the business problems. It's beginning to break down silos. It's beginning to get the few old subject matter experts who don't want particularly to share because they don't, don't understand how to do it. It's beginning to draw them into the conversation. It's about business issues and about teaching, helping, supporting young people trying to learn the business and get into it. We've strengthened what we started early on, which is a learning champion function. People within this change team are now out in the business, understanding business problems, sitting with business leaders, experiencing what happens when a piece of machinery breaks down at 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning, understanding exactly what is going, what is going on there. And we're strengthening that whole thing. It's the alignment of the community I've talked about already, the change team I've just mentioned, but we're also carrying on with benchmark and best practice. If any of you have got anything that you'd like to contribute to this whole thing, I'd be very pleased to hear from you afterwards, because it's an open book now. Who can be drawn into this whole equation who can actually offer advice, experience, tricks, and all the rest of it, um, to, make it to make it happen? And what we're trying to do is, this is the, the real creativity. We're trying to gen generate what we're calling the immersiveversity. I told you to come back to the photograph later. What we're trying to do is to generate a vision for an entirely new concept, and this is what Machella has brought on to. Because what it's going to be, it's going to be a totally virtual environment. An environment in which the person can walk into, imagine this room, with totally interactive walls. In the end, hopefully looking like the inside of a power plant. So the person can walk in and can draw that speaker out of the picture on the wall into a 3D image in the middle of it and start asking himself questions. Can I service that? Can I repair that? Can I do things with it? If I can't, then the technology will enable him to go through that door over there into a room which will teach him whatever basics he needs to need, that he needs to have before he comes back, tests himself in here, still doesn't know, go through another door, it's a bit more over here. And you see the virtual concept of this whole thing. So the, the hub will be this virtual environment with walls which contain, can contain things like slide presentations, PDFs, academic stuff, whatever it might be, but also can contain models, can contain um, interactive simulation and all the rest of it for people to use. Trying to get hold of the vast knowledge base which exists. One of the things that has happened, you know, you know where South Africa is, it's the bottom end of that big continent, the world's biggest continent, 7,000 miles away from here, but it's also 5,000 miles from civilization. There's a huge gap, it's isolated. South Africa in those pariah years became very isolated. The universities drew within themselves, they looked at themselves, the industry drew into itself and looked at itself. It's taken an awful long time to, for that to break down. By using the internet, by using open education resources and all the rest of it, we're beginning to burst open those bonds. So MIT's open education resources material is being used. The material from Hitachi, Siemens, the manufacturers, is being pulled into the learning pool. It's challenging what's going on electronically. So we're trying to make sense of the information explosion. Building worldwide communities of expertise um, to do the thing. And going right back into the university thing by partnering with the universities to say, we are learning, you learn with us, let's partner with you. And the creation of a, a very um, exciting master's program, new professorships, new PhD students, new master's students to provide new knowledge relevant to the industry um, and at the same time do a lot of, of, of research which can, be, which can be used and fed back into the whole system. So in a sense what we're trying to do is create a completely vertical but industry-wide concept. That's Cassini, that's one of the new plants that's being built due to open next year because what, one of the issues is how do you make this thing work? It's using technology which is absolutely brand new. It's never been run before, it's been designed by the manufacturers, so we've got to make it work. So there's a real business problem that has to be handled there by as yet inexperienced people who are lacking in confidence. So one of the lessons that we've learned out of this so far, and this is almost my last slide, top-down directed solutions do not work. It has to come from the business, it has to come from the people who are actually working in it. If L&D can't, can't change, then do something else. 
You have to, if you're working with business, use what works for you. I've been in business for a very long time. I was a training director of a multinational on stage. And I know very well that I can sit in the boardroom and people would say, well, what can we cut this year? L&D isn't adding any value, cut L&D. Ever more so right now. The work that was done at Online Educator in, in November on business scenarios looked at what would happen if we were skipped. No more resources. What are we going to do? We're going to look at where those few resources that we have can be applied and can do things constructively. So, here we are. Right. Avoiding conversion of old courses has given us the opportunity to do new things. We haven't had to go through that big loop which so many people have had to go through because we've been able to say, all right, it was there. We're now going to create something completely different over here. So that was a bit of bravery to say we're going to toss the old out and try something new. I'm not saying we've succeeded yet, but this, but this is the vision for it. Right? Individual leadership and peer pressure from Robert, fairly junior in the organisation, having the tenacity of a Jack Russell Terrier with a rabbit in its mouth, um, driving through and challenging the blockages that he's found all the way through to the peer pressure from Terry among his, among his senior line management associates and now from Marcello to the rest of the directors saying there is a new and different way of doing this whole thing. The importance of creating a vision. I think the key to this whole thing was being able to go back to him, to Marcello and saying, we can see a different way of doing this. And Michelle listened and said, hmm, I can sign on to that. Let's go try it. And then in lifting it out from hidebound, tender-driven, budget-driven things to saying it's an idea I'm going to pursue until it either succeeds or fails. That is magic for us. Right? And then the fact that we had Terry there and the other, the other people involved in the project are all actually ex-line people. The, the fact they understood the business problems. They knew what would have to happen. What they needed was somebody and the thought leadership group to actually say, these are ways we can actually try and tackle them. Okay, let's, how do we implement it? How do we get this into practice? That's very important. So, the story ends with an African sunset. Photograph taken the last day I lived in South Africa. There's my details. Thank you for listening. Social media and you know social media being worldly focused towards your employee. But there's a whole world of social media outside where people are talking about your organization, your product, your services, etc. So did you even try and take it to the next level and see what's happening in the social media, what feedback you're getting from the outside world? Of course, yes. Um, South Africa has, has a number of other issues. We've all got computers, every single one of us, I guess. An African world. Most Africans will aspire to having a computer one day. They just can't afford them. That's, that's the first thing. Second thing is the bandwidth is very poor. The third thing, which is the huge, wonderful thing about it, is every one of them has a mobile phone of some description because it's a life necessity. They're living in rural communities. They need healthcare. They need this. They need that. And the mobile connectivity is very good. So one of the big and wonderful challenges here is how can we use the social media, how can we use mobile learning to get this information to people 24-7, wherever they are, and in simple ways. So yes, we've looked hugely at how social media can work in that, in that sense. Have I answered the question? Good. Hi, Nick. Um, I'm interested in the uh, point you made around the thought leadership group, so that yeah. being a global community. Um, I suppose I'm, the, the question I'm asking is, what was your strategy about putting this together? Did you have, uh, you know, people already in mind, or was it a kind of, you know, a message out there to the big world helping and drawing these people in? Um, I'm not sure it was either of those. It was a kind of discovery from when I came back two years ago. I didn't know any of these people because South Africa wouldn't have known many of these people. Their, their connectivity is so bad that doing the kind of standard research. 
that we're able to do here. It just couldn't happen. So when I came back and I started to look for best practice, this whole new world opened up in front of me. It was like walking through the looking glass, you know? Um, and in that, I began to discover people who had got plenty to offer in that kind of arena. <coughs> so in a sense, it's people I've discovered, it's people who come to me, it's people who are, in, who are now, in a sense, picked to be there. Um, it's, it's Canada, it's the States, it's China, it's Norway, it's the UK, it's Spain. You know, it, it goes on. There are people in that thought leadership group from all over the world. What was the purpose behind the question? I'm just wondering what they specialise people within that sort of the arena of utilities. What did you expand to? Initially, it was a group just to share thoughts. You know, here's the issue. What can we do? As the vision is formed, what I've tried to do is to assemble around myself because I've got a project lead this thing, and assemble around myself people who I think are going to provide me with the best advice, perhaps some implementation in the particular areas. Um, so there's somebody looking at the academic aspects, the OER stuff, the breaking down the silos in the universities. I know two people in there. One of them, if I get time to these, I might just tell you about it in a second. Um, there are people looking at the social media, the people looking at the use of mobile learning and so on. We brought all those pieces together. And what's incredible about the team, and I didn't know this when we put it together, is the sort of synergy and overlap which we've discovered in the team between one another. You know, I'm an expert in here, but I actually know a lot about that bit. And so on. You know, any of you are going to hear Steve Wheeler later in, in, the, in this conference. Steve is the person I'm going to use for the academic liaison stuff because he's so exciting in, in that arena. But he also knows a huge amount about the technology and the change management and the simulations that need to go on. So he's able to sort of cross-match within that team. One, pe one group I do want to highlight for you. If I said to you, and I've told this story many times, if I said to you Djibouti, Somalia, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, Mozambique, Angola, would you think any of those had academic expertise or any ex expertise, any prowess? 2002, the universities in those countries decided that they were rubbish, all of them. But what they would do is actually get together and try and create something because they had nuggets. It goes back to Edward de Bono this morning. They had nuggets that they could pull out and use together. 2008, they went public with their, with their OER environment, which was for the academic stuff. The last figure that I had was 135,000 hits per month, globally, of people accessing the material they put onto OER. And I saw literally this morning uh, a tweet from them to say they've just received a further £15 million sponsorship for the work that they're doing, $15 million sponsorship for the work they're doing. They're the UNESCO um, Best Emerging Education Initiative globally. Now, coming out of those countries, wow, how exciting. Sorry, I had to put that oh, right. into the, into the equation. Um, hi, Nick. You, you mentioned earlier about aligning the outcomes to the business. Yep. Can you give us some examples of what they may be and, and how you did that? It's well, one of the biggest challenges we all face. Right. First, the recruitment. First, the recruitment challenge. You know? I don't know how many of you have done any work in recruitment. If you're going to end up with 5,000 people, you start off with a lot more than 5,000. How are you going to manage to get more than 5,000, however many more it is, how many times more it is, into the system, properly mentored, access to good material, able to understand what it is that they're learning to bring into the business. That's one of the first challenges. The second challenge is that in the power industry, there's some very intractable problems globally. Um, you probably don't know the power industry. It consists of giant boilers into which you squirt large amounts of coal, which is which are ground up finer than, than talcum powder, into, uh, into big furnaces with, with literally millions of inch and a half diameter tubes around them, which are 500 degrees centigrade, 400 atmospheres pressure. Those tubes burst, and they're critical because they can actually burst the boiler and they can kill people. That's an intractable problem globally. What we've done now is we've put them into practice around it from academia and from other power stations and the rest of it to tackle that particular problem using this kind of approach. There's a two topics. Right, do we have any more questions? We have one more. Okay, one, one or two more questions and then we can break for lunch. Because I'm sure you all don't want to be at the back of the queue this year. <laughs> 
the work you're doing. What you're doing to give confidence to the management. Look, there's a plan and there's a return on this. Right. Um, there is now a project plan of things that we're going to try and implement by particular dates, but that for me is a lousy KPI. Um, the KPI is literally, can we keep the lights burning, can we get the plan commissioned on time, are people confident, and then behind that, what are the retention rates of people who are coming into the business, what are the accident rates like, and so on, uh, breakdown rates like, and so on. So we're looking at all of that kind of stuff. But remember what I said as well, this is actually now a research project. So in a sense, this is, do these approaches work? at the end of the day. And each particular piece of the kit that's going in, or the, the design that's going in, will have to have its own particular KPIs attached to it. Probably not answered you very well. <coughs> the fear is that you said earlier they've done other stuff in the past and it hadn't worked for people didn't have confidence. Being able to measure and demonstrate things aren't happening and it's going the right way is critical to get people Buy, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so the first stage is can we get the stuff installed? Um, built and installed. Some of it is very far out of technology. Um, second stage of it is will people buy, in, buy into it? And then the third stage is what is the impact it's having around, around the business? I can't give you a better answer than that. Right, we're dead on 12.30, so I'd like to stop there. If you'd like to put your hands together for Laura and Nick.